Well, good morning. I want to open with a scripture. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Today, as we wrap up this, this year, this series, as we've walked through the story of scripture, I want to talk to you today about trees and fruit. But before I do that, let me just say hi. Uh, if you've never met me, uh, I am the founding pastor here, Riverside. It's been a while since we've been up here. My wife is Teresa. She cannot be here today, but she sends her greetings. She is in Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, caring for her mother, who had some pretty, pretty serious health issues and uh, is, uh, is pretty much laid up right now and needing her daughter to be there with her. So she sends her love. <clears throat> and um, people ask me, well, so how's retirement going? And <clears throat> I have to think, am I retired? I surely don't feel like it. I say I've repurposed because I still do some coaching and consulting, but uh, I do have a little more freedom. <clears throat> it's nice not to have to worry about every Sunday and managing a team and a staff and buildings and budgets and policies and all that stuff. And I'm so glad that Pastor David gets to carry that burden now. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's nice, it's nice. But I found, and I think everybody could agree with me, that every stage of life has some good things and some pretty difficult things, right? Life is good and life is hard. And we have to hold both of those things together at the same time very often in life. Um, so, I mean, that's my story. Um, what's yours? Who here loves a good story? One of the things that, that I like to do in retirement is, um, is really engage in a good story. My mind enjoys reading a good book or watching a good movie or following or streaming a good miniseries. And uh, I, I've been able to do that. I've been able to do that a lot. Recently, I've, I've enjoyed doing some, reading some memoirs of people. And two that, I'm, that I really enjoyed was Eugene Peterson, who, who translated the Message Bible that many of you are familiar with. He wrote his memoir before he passed away, or he had somebody, it's basically his autobiography, not a memoir, but an, a, a, a biography of him. And then Philip Yancey, who was one of my favorite Christian authors over the years, has just wrote a memoir, and I highly recommend his memoir, Philip Yancey. It's, it's called, I think, Where the Light Shone, or something like that. Um, but yeah, I love books, I love a good story. Been listening to audiobooks, some of the classics, uh, the Count of Monte Cristo. In fact, I'm listening to Moby Dick now, and I didn't realize how much of Moby Dick is boring. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm fast forwarding. You know, if you have audiobooks, you can listen to it at like high speed. So I'm like on double speed, and I can barely understand it. Just get through all the stuff. I want to get to the whale and the encounter and all of that. But, uh, but yeah, I've been, been love watching a few good series, one of which is This Is Us. How many of you are fans of this TV series, This Is Us? And you know that, I think it was last week or this week, it's kind of wrapping up six seasons. And uh, I, I'm, I'm blowing uh, in, <laughs> in my microphone here, sorry about that. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm engaged now, Teresa and I are, th you know, since we've been apart, she's in Indiana and, and uh, we were like three episodes behind, so I don't want any spoiler alerts. Please don't tell me it's depressing enough because it mirrors what she's going through right now and what we're going through with her mother. But, but this is us. It's a sappy, emotional NBC TV drama that follows the story of a Pittsburgh family. That's, it got, I got engaged early on because, you know, originally it's set in, in Pittsburgh and there's references to events in Pittsburgh when I was a kid in the 70s. And, and, um, and so I love it, but it follows this Pearson family through several generations. And the narrative or the, the story arc is really around the life of who I think is the central character, which is the mother, Rebecca, played by Mandy Moore. And she's a young wife pregnant with triplets in the 70s, and now she's the aging parent. And it's all about, you know, the, uh, the dynamics, the family dynamics. How many of you who follow that tear up in almost every episode? 
You know, I have to say this. In our, in, in our family, between Teresa and I, I'm the crier. <laughs> I think she just has a cold heart, you know? <laughs> And uh, I, she will now, you know, her heart's been melted pretty badly recently. But anyhow, each, each episode is tugging on your heartstrings because it, it jumps back and forth in time to let you see how childhood experiences and family dynamics shape us as we get older and how that affects our adult life and our adult relationships. And um, in the series, I've, I realize, is entitled This Is Us because all, we can see ourselves in the story, right? We just see, this is my life. This is what we go through. This is how families are, and these are the, the blessings and the burdens that families carry. Which brings us to this story that we're talking about here. We've been walking through that over the past, through this story over the past nine months here at Riverside. And, and as the biblical, the, the, the this is us, has a story arc that follows the life of the mother and the, and the children, this has a story arc also, and, or a plot. And in the Old Testament, the story arc follows the history of the Hebrew people. In fact, we can call the Old Testament the Hebrew Scriptures because it's about the Hebrews. And then we can call the New Testament the Christian Scriptures because it's about the birth of Christianity through Jesus and the expansion uh, of, the, of the early church. So we have the Hebrew or the Old Testament Scriptures, the Christian Scriptures, the New Testament Scriptures, and each of them has this arc. And as good stories weave together with a thread, they're woven together through a thread in the, in the TV series, This Is Us, one of the threads are the Thanksgiving, the family Thanksgiving dinners. And you'll see throughout the ages and the years and the decades uh, episodes that are centered around the family Thanksgiving dinner. Well, in scripture, one of the threads that weaves the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures together, the Old and New Testament, is trees, trees. The story begins in the garden with a tree in the middle and it ends with a city garden with the, with the tree in the middle. And so I want to follow the ark here this morning. And as I do, I want you to sort of observe the story. Let's step back. We've been kind of doing the, the runway walk through. Now we're going to take the 30,000 foot view of the story and glean, I think, the major message of this story. So, can I just pray before I continue here? God, as, as we step back and, and take a look at, at the book, the book, the story, may we glean the major truths from this so that our story can be a better story than what it would be had we not read this story. So give us ears to hear, hearts to comprehend, and hands and feet to follow through, I pray. Amen. Amen. So there's a four-part arc here, and the first one is the story of creation. We were all, probably, most of you are familiar, almost all of you are familiar with the story of creation, right? And the tree in the story of creation is the tree of life. Genesis 2 says the Lord God made all sorts of trees grow out of the ground. Trees that were beautiful and produced delicious fruit. And in the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life. And there was also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We'll get there in part two. But Genesis 1, this is Genesis 2, Genesis 1 is sort of the creation story or the account of God creating order, order and beauty out of the chaos of the primordial creation. And day by day, God gives function to the stars and the sun and the sea and the land and the animals. And, and, and after the six days, he rests. And what we don't 
probably realize from our understanding or reading of the story is this is really a depiction of a temple, a temple where the temple is all of creation. The Bible says that uh, heaven is uh, God, uh, God's throne and the earth is God's footstool. And so this is really about the throne of God, the temple, and a temple really is a dwelling place of God. So it's a story about the dwelling place of God and the functions of God in this dwelling place that we call the universe and particularly earth. I know that's kind of a little abstract for us to get our heads around, but it's important that we understand that because God enters his rest on the seventh day. And that doesn't mean God stops, but the temple is created and all the functions of the universe are put in place and God sits back and says, okay, humanity, Adam, Eve, and all of your children, your job is to steward this and I will sustain it, I will support you, I will uphold that. And so then we come to the garden in Genesis 2 that represents this temple where in the center of the garden, like, like the temple that was built, the, the physical temple that God gave instructions for them to build, in the center of which was the Holy of Holies, which was the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. So in this garden temple, the center of it is the tree of life. And the tree of life represents God because as long as they are to partake from the tree of life and all the other trees in the garden except for one, they can enjoy the bliss of God's presence and God's provision and God's safety and God's security and, 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 and God in the middle is there as the source and the sustainer and, and, and giving the humans and, and his creation everything that it needs to thrive. And so those who eat from the tree of life receive God's life and God's power and God's creativity. And as long as they, as long as they do that, they have eternal life. Now, time out for just a second. Let's talk about eternal life. When I, th when I say the word eternal life, what comes to mind for you? I think for me, oftentimes it's about, well, living forever. It's about the, the quantity of time. But I want you to realize that eternal life in Scripture doesn't just speak of the fact that we will never die and we can live forever. It speaks of a quantity of time. A quantity. I mean, I mean a quality. A quality of time. And that quality of time is a time where we don't have tears. We don't have regret. We don't have sorrow. We don't live with fear. We don't live in shame. And so... So the summary of part one of the story is the tree of life that represents God at the center and the source and who is the sustainer of life. So let's just go there in our minds for a minute. We're in that place. We're innocent. We're unconcerned. We're not worried about where we're gonna get our next meal. We don't fear a global pandemic. We're not upset when the market crashes or when inflation goes through the roof. I mean, whew, now we're talking, right? Now we're, now we're, we don't have to worry about paying for everything, the cost of everything. And most importantly, in that place, we know that we are loved and cared for. Isn't that nice? Great place, right? Love it. Love it. But in the story, if this were a movie, this is where the soundtrack would turn a little dark. The music would change. If you know, if you're watching a drama, it goes from boom, 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 and everything gets heavy, and you realize that this story is about to take a turn. So like every good story, there has to be some drama to make it interesting in this. That's this story too. So God commanded humans to be able to eat from all the delicious fruit in the garden, everything except for one. And that brings us to part two of this narrative, which is about the fall. 
And uh, the tree in that episode is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2, it says, the Lord commanded the man, uh, you're, to free, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And you'll notice when they do eat from it, they don't die immediately, but their quality of life takes a huge step downward. <clears throat> so, both trees look beautiful, but one of them is a false tree of life. And what that does is it gives people a choice. Will they listen to God and remain in this state of eternal life, where it's not just quantity, but quality of life? Or will they choose to do what's right in their own eyes and suffer the consequences of that? And we know the story. It says in Genesis 3, the woman was convinced. She saw the tree was beautiful. Its fruit looked delicious. She wanted, and notice what it says, she wanted the wisdom that it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it, and then gave it to her husband who was with her. He ate it, and at that moment, their eyes were opened, and suddenly they felt their shame. How tragic. How tragic. The innocence was gone. Fear entered. Struggle entered. They're expelled from the garden, and there they are outside, east of Eden, to use Steinbeck's terminology, living with the dynamics of outside this place where we not just have quantity, but a quality of life. No longer. Life is hard from now on. And so the big question is, once exiled from this, can anybody find their way back to the tree of life? And that's the underlying theme throughout the story is, can we ever get back to the tree of life? And so this is the human dilemma. We, humans, we, people, choose God's life or do we choose what's right in our own eyes? Do we follow gods of our own making or do we respond and trust to the God who made us? The story of Moses, really, and the history of God's people and the Hebrew people in, in, in the Hebrew scriptures really outlines this. And that's really where the plot goes from here on, because Moses comes to another tree or a bush on Mount Sinai, the burning bush, which is like a tree radiating with God's presence and God's life and God's power. And God tells Moses to bring God's people to this mountain where they're able to meet with God, where they're going to encounter God on Mount Sinai, and God's going to there on the mountain force them to make this choice the same way that the choice was given to Adam and Eve, God's people on Mount Sinai were given the choice. Will they follow gods of their own making or will they receive life, identity, destiny, and a future with God leading them. <clears throat> and you know the story. Moses comes down from the mountain, and what does he find? What did they do? They made up a god of their own that they could worship, the golden calf. And, and, and this is the pattern that we see throughout the Hebrew Scriptures time and time again. They are given a choice. Are we going to follow God or are we going to elect kings like all the other nations? Right? Am I going to remain true to my wife or am I going to give in to Bathsheba? Am I going to do the right thing or am I going to let Delilah cut my hair? Am I going to, you know, be a blessing to the nations or am I going to hoard the blessings for ourselves as a kingdom? Uh, are we going to align with, with God or are we going to align with a pagan nation that's going to eventually destroy us? So, you know, throughout reading the Hebrew scriptures, it's like watching a horror movie, right? Where you're wanting to yell to the screen, don't go there. Don't make that choice. Don't go behind that door. 
you know that it's just going to be horrible and you're waiting for tragedy to happen. And as we read the story of the Hebrew people, it's like, why did you do that? And we imagined that we would be better. Mm. You know, we really deceive ourselves, do we not? All right, I'm going to be really pointed. I want you to think back in your life. How many times can you look at moments in your life where you wish you could say, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have gone there. I shouldn't have taken that. Right? Right? And we live with the regrets of those poor choices that we made because we know that we were doing what we thought was right in the moment only to suffer the consequences. So what do the people do after this Mount Sinai experience? They go in, you know, eventually after that generation dies off, they go in, they go in, they want to be this nation that God created that's flowing with milk and honey and be a blessing to other nations. But then again, they just become more and more influenced by the other nations and the other gods of the other nations. And so they start building idols. And if you remember in reading the story, where did they place the idols? They placed them on high places, on hilltops and mountaintops, like trees, false trees, where they would worship these false idols. And so part two of the story is about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and it just represents the price that we pay when we do what is right in our own eyes, which is called idolatry. And idolatry is like a death grip on us that we just can't shake. We, we, we think we do, but then we fall back into it over and over again. And, and so the question is, is there any hope for us? And this is where the music changes a little bit, gets a little more lighter. And we come to part three, which is the story of Jesus and the cross. And that's the story of redemption. I want you to notice something here. Jesus came to announce to us that eternal life is available to us once again through him. And again, it's not just that we can live forever after we die. It's about living in a quality of life beginning now that goes on beyond this life. So it's not just about quantity, it's about a quality of life. And Jesus speaks of himself as the tree of life when he says that he's the true vine that brings God's life fruit into the world. And he invites us to, to eat from him, right? To trust him and to be transformed by his life. In fact, Jesus said, I am the bread of life the living bread that came down from heaven. And anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread which I offer so the world may live is my flesh. Wow. So now Jesus is like the tree of life in the garden. I am now that tree. And if you partake of me, you will have life. And so this time, you know, oh, it goes on to say elsewhere that... Uh, he says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. So it's talking about this quality of life that we have when we partake of Jesus, when we, when we allow his life to flow through us. But Jesus also exposed how corrupt humans are and how, how they love to follow these these false trees of life. And so he presents people with a choice, again, between life and death. But this time they don't just choose death. They, they choose to attack the one who sustains life itself. And Jesus is led up to the top of a hill where, what does he do? He dies upon a tree. A cross. Scripture says, cursed is anyone who is hanged on a tree or dies on a tree. And the cross 
is really the sad and violent result of humanity's desire to do what is right in our own eyes. That's, that's it. And so we, we think seemingly the tree of life, Jesus, is overpowered by the forces of death. And again, the music is pretty dramatic here. But Jesus said that he is like a seed. Again, trees start as seeds, right? That's planted in the ground. And it's planted there to die and to turn into a plant that would grow and bear much fruit. So to defeat death, Jesus had to go through death. To defeat the the death, he had to go through death himself and die like a seed in the ground. Jesus said, I have to go so that you can do far greater things than I have done. But this new tree of life now grows up and it stands before us. And and we're talking about the spiritual life of Jesus now in the spirit. And we can eat from it, but it means we need to pass through death. We have to die to our old self and be born again. We have to let the past be past and be born again to a new life which begins at that rebirth experience to eternal life. We are now, if you are in Christ, you are now in eternity. Think about that. You are now living in eternity right now, but I still may die. Yes, well, we're all going to die a physical death, but we don't die a spiritual death. So you are now given the opportunity to live in a different quality of life that you did prior to your your coming to Christ. But you died to the old self. Jesus said, if anyone wants to come to me, follow me, must take up their cross. What is the cross? It is a place of death. Death to what was so that you can be planted and risen to what is and what can be. And so we need to We need to partake of Jesus' life, eat from it, pass through his death, allow our old way of life to die so that we can now have a new way of life and grow into the new you, the new, and have a new community and a new way of life. And again, repeating, Jesus said, I am the vine, you're the branches. Now we remain in Christ, and now through Christ's life flowing in us and through us, We now are what? The tree of life for others. We become the church of Jesus Christ is the new present tree of life where other people could come and find refreshment and life and hope and joy. And we now are the presence of Christ and God in the world to bless the world. So not only do we eat from it, we are that fruit that produces his life so that it can spread to others. So, how does the story end? It ends as it began, in a new garden-like city. And that comes to part four, which is the consummation or the restoration of all of things. And we see in the book of Revelation at the end of the story, the tree of life shows up again. And notice in this imagery, uh, the scripture says, John, uh, you know, sees this image of the one who is sitting on the throne, God in his throne room again. And he's saying, look, I'm making everything new. It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Let all who are thirsty come to me, and I will freely give them. Let them drink from the springs of the water of life. It also says in that chapter, he says, I I saw no temple in the city. Notice the temple imagery. I saw no temple in the city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb is its temple, meaning God... We are living in the presence of God's place. 
and the whole earth is now the temple of God once again. And I love Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me the river of, uh, showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city and on each side, I love it, stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit every season and the leaves are for the healing of the nations. Wow. That's what we have to look forward to in the consummation of things. So the story of the Bible ends in a new garden, which is also like a new kind of temple with the tree of life in the center, providing healing and life forever for those who choose to eat from it. So the end of the story is really a new beginning. Revelation isn't the end, it's a new beginning. It's a new start. It's a new uh, 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 creation where we continue to be who God wants us to be. And so let's bring this to ourselves right here. The story has four parts. There's creation, this period of innocence where we're nurtured and loved and secure in God's presence. Basically, it's the birth of life. And then there's the fall, the loss of innocence, brokenness, struggle, hardship, following false gods, the time of loss. But then there's this opportunity for redemption, and redemption comes through sacrificial love and grace and forgiveness, undeserved, but it's a way back to God where we receive the love of Christ but we die to our old ways. And then there's the, res the, the, the restoration. And the end is like the beginning, which is life. And so I submit to you today that this story is your story. This is us. This is us. This is us. And what that means is the choice is always before you. So what's your story? What's your story? Do you see the arc of your life in this story? You know, when, when you're an infant and a toddler, and maybe through those early years. Yeah, you, you have struggles as a kid, right? You got your own ego you're dealing with and all that. But you're not worried about providing. You're not worried about where your next meal is coming from. And if you're in a, a functional home, you're not worried about whether you're loved and nurtured and cared for. I look at my grandchildren and I think, you don't know how easy you have it, right? But we reach a stage of life where, you know, innocence is lost. We realize our parents aren't perfect. We realize life isn't easy. We realize that people die and we lose things. And we lose a lot of our hopes and dreams of what we think life was supposed to be. We go through this loss of innocence. And then if we're fortunate, if we're lucky, we find love. Maybe love from another person, but maybe most importantly, it's love from God. You understand that the one who knows you best isn't necessarily a person with skin on. But God who knows you best loves you most. And when you receive that love from God, that's totally undeserved, but it is totally yours, just as you are. You're totally loved, accepted, and forgiven. It's like, I need to feast on that in order for my life to have a quality of life that it never would have had otherwise. And you receive Christ, and then you, 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 you're redeemed. And you realize that as you grow older, if you're fortunate enough to do that, that this life is temporary, and all of a sudden, all that you wanted for this life becomes so less important, and you begin to realize that, you know what? 
there will be a time where this body isn't going to get older and feeble, where I'm not going to lose my spouse and lose whatever. From now on, life is good. So where are you in this moment, in this story? Where do you find yourself in this story? Are you following God's ways? Are you continuing to follow the false gods of this world that promise you life is gonna be good, but only ending up with regret and sorrow and mistakes? Because the idols are all around us. They're selling themselves to us every day. As you watch those shows, every commercial, most everyone is a promise of an easier life. And no, I'm not saying everything is bad, but yes, a lot of it can be addictive and destructive. Are you here today and you're saying, I need to find my way back to God? Is that tree of life available to me now? And I wanna tell you, yes, it is because Jesus is here in this moment by his Holy Spirit. And he is saying, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Come to me and find rest for your souls. Come, feast on me, take from me. Why do we partake of communion once a month? And some churches do that every week in mass because we realize we need to be sustained by the lifeblood of Jesus. And that shapes us and forms us. And we bear fruit. We become more and more like Jesus as we feast on him. The scripture says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old is gone. The new life has begun. Are you living in that new life? Or are you still struggling with the idols of your life that have their death grip on you? Today's a day to let go of that and let Christ rule and reign in your life. So only you know where you are in that story. Yeah, we all might look good on the outside. Where are we on the inside? Would you bow your heads with me? Jesus, I thank you for the story that is everybody's story. Thank you for revealing yourself through this. But God, let it not just be a book that sits on our shelf, but may it be a book that is a story that we live in. Thank you for creating us and giving us life. Forgive us for choosing the false gods of this world and, and suffering the loss of innocence and the loss of, of so much. But God, thank you that you showed your love for us through the person and the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. So God, we want to receive that life. We want to receive Jesus' love, his forgiveness, his mercy. We want to partake of the life of Jesus, who is the tree of life for us today. So Jesus, you're the vine. Feed us. We're your branches. We don't want to be like those branches that are not producing fruit that get cut off. We want to be a fresh branch with a fresh flow of Christ's life in us. So God, fill us with your life, I pray. And for anyone here that needs to come back to you today, may this be the day where they say, Jesus, give me yourself. I need you. I want you. Forgive me. Come into my life. Let me die to those things that I know are only going to kill me in the long run. And may I live in this new life, eternal life, so that I can long for that time where the end of this life is just going to be the beginning of a whole new story. In Jesus' name I pray.